Let me uh, just give you a couple of announcements of some things that are happening. Uh, well, one that you can be aware of, and the other is what's happening this weekend. Okay, so I think everybody realized, you know, when we uh, shut down uh, last year uh, for COVID, uh, and we shut down the Sunday school, we took, took advantage of the shutdown of the program uh, to do some much needed renovations. So they started out with renovating uh, the nursery and then painting different classrooms and uh, taking care of some odds and ends with that. And so this week we had uh, new carpet uh, laid in the Sunday school area. And so I'm going to encourage you after the service to kind of go in the back and take a look around. You're going to see that it looks really nice and completely different uh, with the new carpet uh, that goes all the way down the hall. So I don't even know how old that green carpet was. Uh, it was obviously before the tan carpet, and uh, they got rid of that. And uh, uh, so it really looks nice. So I want to thank some guys for their help with this entire project. So first of all, we had to do some drywall work with a couple of the rooms, and so I want to thank Chad and Brian Bortot. Uh, they donated their time and, uh, and really got that uh, drywall work done, so I want to thank them. And then the two main guys who have been working for the last year, more than the last year, uh, with the project have been Randy Conaway and Rob Long. And uh, they have done a fantastic job. And really, I think it would be good for us as a church to show our appreciation to them. They came here during the week, and uh, they had to put up with me. And uh, so uh, let's, let's show our appreciation to those two guys, OK? And I think when you go in the back and you see the work, they have like baseboard down in the hallways now. I mean, it looks really nice. Uh, and uh, so you can express your thanks to, especially to those two guys and to Brian and Chad for some drywall work, okay? The other thing is, okay, this Saturday, we're going to be up in Frenchville uh, for, at the Louders for our uh, church picnic. We didn't have one last year, so we decided to have it up at, uh, up in Frenchville at the Louders. They invited us to their place. They have a nice big pond there with some monster catfish. And uh, so uh, we are going to be up there starting this Saturday, 1 o'clock. We'll start serving the food at 1.30. So you need to come. And uh, so it's going to be a nice menu. It's going to be catered by the Country Butcher. And uh, so we encourage you to come on up and have a really good time uh, this Saturday. Okay, so just want to make mention of that to you. We'll have maps for you right after the service if you need to figure out how to get there. Okay, so we'll have maps for you as well. All right, so let's stand together. We're going to start with a word of prayer, and we're going to ask God's blessing on our service time together. Lord, we do thank you for your love for us and your goodness and your grace. We do thank you for the opportunity that we can gather together on such a beautiful morning to worship you. We pray that every aspect of our time together would glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's worship together, folks. <clears throat>
great is your faithfulness, O God. Oh 
Let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy in our lives. We do thank you for the many, many ways that you work in our lives, the things that you show us, the things that you help us with, even the things that you do in our lives to bring about change so that we can become more like Jesus. Lord, you know our needs, you know the things that are on our hearts, you know how much we need you. I pray, uh, especially this morning, for uh, the Wisers as they, as their Sam and Karen's granddaughter is going to be having surgery uh, tomorrow, I believe. We pray for Emma as she is uh, going to have some surgery on her jaw. God, I'm asking that you would uh, be with her and with the doctors and the surgeons as they take care of the issue. Be with Sam and Karen and, uh, and with, with all of the Wisers in this time. Lord, we pray especially for them because they're with Mabel and we also pray for Mabel and her needs as well. God, we, we thank you for just the reality that we can come to you with a need like that and know that you hear us. There are, there are many, many other needs in our church, people struggling with health issues, people who need you to touch their bodies, give them strength as they care for others who, who have health needs. 
We pray that you would be gracious to all of them, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with finances. Um, in these times, it, it seems amazing that with so much work available that people would still be struggling, but they do. And Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom to provide finances for them to take care of their needs and to, to provide for them. And Lord, if they need a new job, give them wisdom to find the right job. Help them to know where to look. We also pray for relationships, Lord, with, with difficulties and struggles that put stressors on relationships and marriages and, and parent-child relationships. And I pray, Father, that you would bring healing to relationships as well. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you for providing the funds that we need to do renovations. And thank you that those are, have went well. Lord, we have other needs as well in our church, not just monetary, but Lord, for wisdom for the future, how to restart the Sunday school program, how to, how to take care of this and that. And Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom to know how to, to be a church that is ministering to our community that needs Christ. Now, Father, we're, we're going to look into your word, and I pray that you would give us wisdom as we get to know Jesus, as we understand him and understand his purpose, and that he didn't just do things haphazardly. He had a purpose in doing what he did and showing who he is. And help us to understand that today. And even examine our own lives in light of it. So we ask this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Do your work now in our lives, we ask. Amen. All right, folks. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. If you're using a pew Bible, that's page 561. John chapter 2, we're going to look at the last half of chapter 2. We looked at the first half last week of the wedding of Cana, the wedding at Cana. So today we're going to look at John's account of the cleansing of the temple. And, and as I was studying this passage this week, I was kind of amazed. You know, I've, I've gone through this passage numerous times. But I was kind of amazed at the reality of some of the things, and it's going to come out of the message about why Jesus did this. Now, John's gospel lists the cleansing at the beginning of his ministry. When you read the other three gospels, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they list it at the end of their gospels. Is this the same event? Well, I think it's actually two events. This is one event that happened at the beginning. When you look at the other gospels, it's a little bit different account. There's some other things that are happening there. It's very evident that this is a, another event that's listed in those Gospels. John is wanting us to recognize that this is something Jesus did at the beginning of his ministry because he's wanting to communicate something to you and I. He wants us to grab a hold of a truth about Jesus and about ourselves. And that's why we're doing this series. We're doing this series to meet Jesus. And that's because we often assume we know everything there is to know about Jesus. We've heard all the Sunday school stories. We've heard lots of messages. But I think when you get a little bit deeper into the passage, you realize that there's a lot that we don't know about him. And actually, when you get to know him, he exposes where we're at. And when he exposes where we're at, Something's wrong, and it's not with him. What do you mean, George? Well, for instance, okay, so if you go through the Old Testament, every time somebody came in contact with God, their first reaction is horror, and the reason why they have horror is because they recognize who they are and what's wrong with them. See, when you come in contact with Jesus, you immediately begin to realize who you are and what's wrong with you. Like, for instance, I think of in, in, in one of the other Gospels, remember when Jesus was teaching on the seashore, and he says to Peter, set out your boat. He wanted to teach from the boat, and he said, you know, cast your nets over. Oh, Master, we've been working all day, and well, we've caught nothing, but because you said it, I'll do it. And so they caught the biggest catch ever. As soon as 
Peter brings it in. He looks over at Jesus. Now, Jesus, that's all he said was, cast your net. Get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Why? When you understand who Jesus is, he exposes that something's wrong. And that's exactly what's going on here. John is purposely showing us this account of the cleansing of the temple to show you why Jesus showed up and because something was wrong. Something was wrong with their, quote, the God's people, Israel, and their devotion to God. And that's what we're going to see here today. So let's look at this passage together. It's going to be up on the screen for you. We're going to look at verses 13 through 25. Now, look at what, he, what John writes in verse 13. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. When he, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then the disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. All right, so let's take a look at this. We're going to look at a couple of things here. We're going to break it down into two, two basic sections here. We're going to look, first of all, at beneath the surface, beneath the surface of their religious exercise, and we can maybe make some comments on our own here. And then we're going to look at the last part, which is them questioning Jesus, and I've labeled this section, who do you think you are? Okay? Who do you think you are? So let's talk about beneath the surface. All right, so here's what happens. So first of all, I want you to understand, let's set it up in our mind. It says that Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now the Passover was the commemoration of what? When they were brought out of Egypt, out of slavery, you know, they had the Passover, the Passover of the death angel that would go and strike the firstborn of Egypt, except for those who had marked their houses with blood eating the Passover lamb, and then the very next day they went and left Egypt on their journey for the promised land. And so from that point on, God told them that they were to commemorate Passover every year. So it's a big festival, a big time of celebration, a big thing for the Jews. So Jesus goes up to Jerusalem where most would go up, for that celebration. Now you say, go up. He's up in Galilee. How do you go up? I look at the map, it's down. It's not up. They didn't look at things the way we do as far as up or down as far as maps. They did it based on typography. So when you would go up to Mount Zion, you would travel up a mountain. That's why it says, go up. Okay, so he went up to the Passover. So here's what he does. He goes to the temple. Now listen, folks, we know he goes to the temple every year. So he's not seeing anything new. This time, he decides to do something. So let me just stop. Get it in your mind. What they were doing in the temple, they were always doing in the temple. So he decides to act right now for a reason. We'll see why that reason is. So when he goes into the temple, in the court of the Gentiles, now there were several courts surrounding the most holy place. There would be the court of the Gentiles where you and I, because we're Gentiles, we would be allowed to go there. We could go no further. 
To go further, they had a sign that said you would be killed, and they would kill you. Foreigners could only be allowed in the court of the Gentiles. The next court was the court of men. Excuse me, the court of women. All right, so that's as far as a woman could go. The next court beyond that was the court of men. So men were the only ones. No woman could go there. And then there was the court of the priests and, of course, the most holy place. And that's the way it was. So the court of the Gentiles was supposed to be a place where foreigners could come and worship, as well as some other things that were being done there. Now, here's what happened. Over the years, they decided to use the space to make it convenient for people. What do you mean? Well, most people, when they traveled, because of the diaspora, because of the exiles, most Jews were spread out over the world, so they would come and make a pilgrimage back to the temple. So when they came, you wouldn't carry a lamb with you from Greece. You'd buy a lamb where? In Jerusalem. So where do you go? Well, the scripture says, the law said that the lamb had to be inspected before it could be sacrificed. So what's your best chance of getting a lamb that was going to be acceptable right there at the temple? Do you want to make a sacrifice an oxen? You do that. If you're poor, you buy your doves. Where? Right there. at the. It's convenient. Hey, I'm coming from Rome. Got Latin money. Can't use Latin money in the temple. I've got to use temple money. Where do I do the exchange? Right in the court of the Gentiles. And you would bring your money and you would exchange it. Like, you ever been to the airport and you've gone on, like, to Mexico or something and you had to exchange money? Okay, that's what they had there. Only they would charge exorbitant fees for changing the money. So all this is taking place there. So here's what happens. Jesus comes along and he decides enough. So here's the points I want you to see. Here's the first one. Convenience and good intentions became an excuse for personal profit. Convenience and good intentions became an excuse for personal profit. Now let me just stop. Having animals available for pilgrims coming from a long distance to buy, that's a good idea, isn't it? Exchanging money into a one currency to be used in the temple, that's a good idea, right? It started out with a good idea. It started out with good intentions. Now, here's what happened. As with all things, somebody realized we can make some money here. And the priests of the temple institutionalized it, and they got their cut. It was a known fact. So what started out good ended up becoming corrupt. Still happens to this day. Still happens in Christian ministries, and I hate to say it, even in churches. What turns out to be a convenience and a help can sometimes become a source of income. And this is really irritating to Jesus. Now, here's the second thing I want you to see. God sees through our spiritual systems and demands a proper focus. Notice with me at verse 15 and 16. Notice what happens. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. God sees right through it. Jesus saw right through it. It wasn't convenience. It wasn't help. It was about money. It wasn't about worship. And that place was supposed to be a place of worship for who? The rest of the nations. For you and I. So that they could come and worship God. But they had used it for what? Their own personal profit. God sees right through it. He sees right through all of the, quote, good intentions. In fact, you're going to see that point being made several times in this passage about how God sees right through it. And so there's something wrong here. So beneath the surface, he's seeing a really big, major issue. Now here's what happens. These folks recognize that something special's happening. 
and they know what's happening, and so they react. And how they react is, who do you think you are? By upsetting the apple cart. So we're going to look here, the rest of our time, we're going to see six things that come out of this that I want you to see, that Jesus is bringing forth. And you're going to see who he really is and what it exposes about even ourselves. Here it is. Here's the first one. Look with me at verse 17. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. They're quoting Psalm 69 verse 9. Okay, they're quoting Psalm 69, verse 9. Here's what's going on. Those who are seeking the promised one understand what is happening. Those who are seeking the promised one understand what is happening. So here's his disciples. Remember, they've already recognized that he's the Messiah. They've already recognized that he's the Son of God. They've already recognized there's something special about Jesus. So when Jesus does this, Here's what they're doing. They realize, oh no. This is in fulfillment of God's word. This is who he is. And so they understand. So for instance, I'm telling you folks, if you know Jesus and you're in his word, you're not shaken by the stuff that happens around you in this world that happens all overseas and so forth. You're not shaken by any of that stuff because you look at it and you realize Okay, I see where it's heading. I understand where things are moving to. And we do understand where they're moving to, right? They're understanding ultimately somewhere down the road could be next year, could be 100 years from now, but everything's moving to what? Jesus coming back, right? Those who seek him understand what's happening. Okay, so they're recognizing what's going on here. Here's the second thing I want you to see. The problem is, is that some wanted a better situation without changing. What do you mean, George? Well, look with me at verse 18. Here's what they do. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? What do you, what do you mean they want a better situation without changing? Well, here's what's going on. What Jesus did was so remarkable it never happened before and the reason why it never happened is because the old testament told them that only once person was supposed to do what jesus did it's from malachi chapter three notice with me it'll be up on the screen with you chapter three listen to what the prophet wrote behold i send my messenger and he will prepare a way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, and they may offer the Lord an offering in righteousness. He's going to show up, the prophet says, the messenger, the special one's going to show up, and he's going to clean house, so to speak, in the temple, and cleanse the house of Levi. Guess what Jesus did? Showed up, what did he do? Get rid of this money-scrubbing stuff. This is a place of worship. Now, they understood that. Why do you think they asked? Because here, notice something. When you go through the Gospel of John, the Jews are always asking for what? A sign. A sign to what? Prove who Jesus is. They know that what he's doing is something the Messiah would do. Now, here's the thing. They, listen to me, they wanted a better situation but without changing. What do you mean a better situation? Well, during Jesus' day, they were wanting the Messiah to show up. But here's why they wanted the Messiah to show up. Throw the Romans out. Get rid of the oppression of Rome. But that's all they wanted. 
Here, the Messiah in this, in this prophet is saying, the prophet is saying he's going to show up and he's going to clean house in the temple and purify their worship. But the problem is, that's not what they want him to do. They want him to clean up their world, but don't change them. Do you see what I'm saying? See, they, they wanted to him to show up, but they didn't want to change. You know, it's the same thing I see happening today in North America. I'm just being honest with you in the church. Okay, so I probably would say not a month goes by, if you listen to the Christian radio or if you get a Christian publication or something, you will hear someone say that we need to pray for revival in America. You hear that? Now, let me just say that that is a wonderful prayer request. But I don't think people know what they're talking about when they pray for that. What do you mean? Only God can change America. Yeah, only God can change America. But do you realize what you're praying when you're praying for a revival? See, when we pray for that, we're wanting all the mess that's outside of us to clean up. But do you realize in revival, it doesn't start outside. It starts with you. Nobody want, in fact, I'm not the problem. Why do I need to change? You need to change. Then he cleans up the outside. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's, but that's not what we're praying for, George. I think everything's okay in the church. I think everything's okay. I mean, I'm, yeah, I've got some problems, but I, I'm living with them. You know what? God isn't living with them. And yeah, pray for revival, but revival means... He wants to change you. See, we're in the same situation as these Jews. We want the Messiah to show up, throw out the Romans. But don't you dare touch our temple worship. See, this is the number one reason why they wanted Jesus dead. is because he was coming to turn things around back to God the way it should be. Do you see what I'm saying? This is, this is who he is. This is what he's doing. Here's the third thing I want you to see. While they understood what he was doing, they questioned his authority. Because he made them uncomfortable. But actually, can I tell you? It's because they didn't want to know him. In fact, John told us that. Where? John chapter 1. If you want to, just flip back to John chapter 1, verse 11. It'll be up on your screen. Look at what it says. It was, he, in that prologue section where he's kind of introducing the concept of Jesus to us as the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But look at verse 11. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. See, this is the reality. The reality is, is they understood what he was doing. Do you understand? When Jesus was cleaning the temple, they knew what was going on. But it was hidden too close to home. So they're asking that, the way we would say a question, who do you think you are? Isn't that the way it is? Let's be honest. You know, I, I think about myself. Uh, you know, we all come in contact with people every day, right? I mean, we live interacting with people every day. Now, some of those people pluck your nerves, right? You have people pluck your nerves, or do you live in a perfect world where everyone treats you just right? Now, people pluck our nerves, right? And, and you pray for them. Oh, God, take care of them. Whatever way you mean by that. But guess what? He takes care of you. That's where the problem is. And so then we're like, well, wait a minute now, Lord. What are you doing? Who do you think? I was wanting you to change them. But you're changing me. I don't know if I can like that. 
And we don't, do we? This is what's going on here. This is what's going on here. What is happening here? When you look at verses 19 to 22, they just don't see it. Look at what it says, verse 19. Back over to chapter 22. Excuse me, chapter 2. Verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when, his when he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Here's what's going on. They were blinded to what Jesus was saying and doing. You know what should have been their response? Because first of all, they're looking for him, right? They're, they're like, oh, come Messiah. Well, guess what? He shows up and he does exactly what the prophet in the Old Testament said he would do. He cleans the temple. And they're like, who do you think you are? Well, they should have said, he's here. But they're blind to it. They can't see it. So even when he says, destroy this temple, they're thinking the temple that they were in. Now, they were in Herod's temple. Let me explain to you. So there was a temple that Solomon built. That's the first temple. That was destroyed by the Babylonians. Then they had a 70-year captivity. When they came back, they laid the foundation and built Zerubbabel's temple. That's the second temple. Now, Zerubbabel's temple pretty much functioned for several hundred years and then Herod, you know, the Tetrarch, Herod comes along and what? He renovates it. He renovates it into something spectacular and beautiful according to what he thought. And that's the temple they're in. It's the renovation. Now it took 46 years for the renovation to take place. So they're like, we're going to destroy this place. It took 46 years to get this. What's going on? They didn't understand what he was saying. Because Jesus, what he was talking about was the temple of his body. And they couldn't see it. In fact, it isn't just them that couldn't see it. It was the disciples. It wasn't until what? Jesus rose from the dead that they even realized what he was saying. They were blind. What blinds them? Can I tell you what blinds them? It's the same stuff that blinds us. Our personal agendas, our goals, our ambitions, what we want. It blinds us to God working in our lives. Because what I want is more important than anything, isn't it? At least that's what we think. But then when God shows up, we can't see him. Because like in this situation, he does the exact opposite of what we think he should be doing. And that's how God acts. Now, I'm always blown, blown away by John the Baptist. Okay, we talked about John the Baptist. I've mentioned this to you again. I've got to mention it to you one more time. Remember John the Baptist, we're going to hear that he's thrown in prison by Herod, a different Herod. And he's thrown in prison and he's facing death. And he's, he's sitting there. Of course, you're in a dungeon. And you were just the one for telling the Messiah coming. And you want the Messiah to come. And and, and, and so he sends disciples and says to Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus said, go and tell, tell, tell John what you see. And uh, the, blind, the, the blind see, the lame walk, you know, people are being set free, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then he says, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That's an odd thing to say. Jesus, when he's telling him that, is quoting three different passages from Isaiah. Sorry, I just got a scratch. That was in my Kerwinsville Christian mug. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Ooh, wrong passage to do that with, right? Okay. Just kidding. When you look at those three passages, you realize that Jesus left something off in quoting them. 
he left off that he would set the prisoners free. What's he doing? He's telling John, John, you're going to die there. Then he says, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. What's the whole point? That God doesn't act the way that we want him to act. And blessed is the one who's not offended because of that. See, this is what's going on here. They were blinded to what they're saying. But here's the thing. When you get to the rest of the part there, where it just kind of gives you a, a basic outline of what's going on at the Passover, look with me at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, and when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Here's the final thing I want you to see about Jesus. Sadly, many respond to Jesus because of what he can do for them. But notice what it says. He knows that. But he doesn't commit himself to them. Why? Because he knows their hearts. Look, I'm old enough now a lot of you have been stomping around the earth long, for a long time and you've interacted with people. I'm sure you've come across somebody that just, when you meet them, like, oh yeah, they are your friend. They will do anything for you. And uh, we're, we're supporting you until the rubber meets the road. And where are they? Where are they? And you thought, and you were like devastated. I thought they would be there. Well, the reason why we're devastated is because we don't know what, who they really are, right? Now we find out later, but I'm going to be honest with you. That kind of thing didn't happen with Jesus. When he's betrayed or he's denied or he's rejected, he already knew it. So when he's got all these people who are excited, oh, Jesus, wow, you're going to see it later when he's feeding the 5,000 people are showing up, yes, but then when he starts saying things like, eat my flesh, drink my blood, they're like, whoa, we don't want anything to do with that, we're out of here, and the text will tell you that they only showed up because they were being fed, but the fact is, Jesus knows us. which goes back really to the heart of this whole passage. Here he shows up in the place of worship where people are supposed to be worshiping God. And he's the son of God. And he knows exactly what's going on. Because he knows men's hearts. That's the reality. What's, what does that mean to you and I? Look here, folks. Jesus knows us. He knows your heart. He knows what motivates you. He knows where you're truly at. See, because you can, here's the thing. Anybody can say, I love Jesus. Well, didn't he say in Matthew? In that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not know you? Did we not cast out demons and do these great things in your name? And Jesus says in the passage of Matthew, and he will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. So listen, folks. So where are you at? Where am I at? Jesus knows where we're at. The question is, do you know where you're at? Something to think about. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. And it just it blows me away, Father, to, to realize that your son would come and he would from the beginning, do the things that would show who he is. And people would give lip service about wanting him, but then when he's wanting change, 
they weren't willing to do that. And, and I can't sit in judgment of these folks from long ago because I, I realize, Father, that I'm like that myself. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to genuinely seek after Jesus. Help us to understand and follow him. I pray this for myself. I pray this for each one here. I thank you for Jesus, for the sacrifice that he made for us and the opportunity that he gave us through his sacrifice to enter into that relationship with you. May we pursue that. I pray that for myself and for each one here. In the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so guys, here's what I want you to do. After we're done, there's two things. Head on back, take a look at the renovations the guys made. Look at the carpet. I think you'll be really impressed with all the work. Now, they do have some touch-up things. Don't sit there and say, oh, well, I can see here that they need to dab some paint over here. I know some of you will do that, okay? Uh, don't do that. They're going to take care of it, okay? Uh, but it, check it out in the back. And uh, also, here is a map. For those of you who know how to use one, Okay, because I know we've forgotten how to use maps with our phones now. But for those of you who need a map, there are some maps right down here. This is a map. I keep this map. Matt, Denny made this map for me 10 years ago. And I keep it in a file. And I know exactly where it is. His place is 13.1 miles from Sap Brothers. So if you know where Sap Brothers is, 13.1 miles up towards Frenchville. You make a turn and you come to his um his uh place now i'm gonna tell you folks we got a wonderful menu you want me to share it with you okay here it is they're gonna have half chickens pulled pork hamburgers and hot dogs baked beans macaroni and cheese coal now here's the stuff i'm not interested coleslaw and potato salad okay all right, and then get back to something that I do like, fruit cup, okay? Now, we'll have drinks for you, and, uh, of course, we'll have, we'll have snacks, prepackaged snacks and so forth for you to munch on for your sweets. But we're going to start serving at 1.30, okay? So you need to know it. it'll start at 1, but we start serving at 1.30, and then we'll, it, we'll just enjoy ourselves all day. Our theme is we are family. You know, one thing that COVID did show us is that church isn't the service it's the people and when we were not meeting together we needed to meet together right so this is an opportunity for us just to connect together at the louders we're gonna have a great time they got volleyball they got horseshoes they got fishing uh it's going to be a wonderful time and we'll look forward to seeing you there if you got questions you can ask me maps will be right down here all right, so let's stand together, and we're going to ask God's blessing as we go and head on back and take a look at the renovations, okay? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us, your goodness to us, and we pray that this week would be a week in which you would be glorified in our lives, that we would see you in ways that we have not seen you before, that you would work in our lives and draw us closer to you. Lord, be with us until we gather again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, if you need to talk to me or the elders, we'll be down front.